Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We live in a time of what we could call a great expectations. I mean, coming out of two years of COVID and pandemic restrictions, life has mostly reopened and resumed a somewhat regular rhythm and flow. It's a new normal, to be sure, but it's an ebb and a flow to which we can adjust. And at the same time, there are things of life that are challenging as well as some things that are dangerous coming at us over the horizon. As Charles Dickens wrote in his Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom and it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. That was the world in 1859. One could say that while a lot has changed in 164 years since those words were first written, it's still like the Bible says. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. We see great technical advances that can be beneficial for humankind being weaponized and launched to the misery of millions. We live in an information age where communications between people separated by great distances could collaborate for the betterment of societies and cultures being used for misinformation and disinformation, for taunting and bullying people in short, for moments that serve to tear down rather than to encourage and build up one another. Prosperity lapses into recession while leaders carve out their slice of the pie, unwilling to seek improvement for those whom they govern. People seek new leadership and new direction for the benefit of all, anticipating better days ahead with the expectations of being able to move beyond the status quo. With everything that has changed, much has remained the same since Dickens first penned his lament. Judea in 30 AD was truly a parallel time of great expectation. Politically, the Jews had been under the rule of Rome since 63 BC, six long decades. The Romans had played it smart, first intervening into Judea in order to bring order to the region, extending their control in what we now call the Middle East. The Romans had managed to place a puppet king on the throne while they allowed the Jews to form their own ruling council, the Sanhedrin. And as long as the Jews paid their taxes, which coincidentally were collected by fellow Jews, and as long as they behaved themselves, well, the Sanhedrin was allowed to govern the day-to-day -day life while the king would tend to eat, drink, be merry, and occasionally make a decree on matters according to what the Romans told him he could say. 67 years after their intervention, Rome was firmly in control, assisted by Jews whose main concern was how they could profit off the burdens placed on others. The various factions dealt with the situation of a what was with the anticipation of what possibly could be if and when the Messiah showed up. Previously, there had been a number of people who rose up claiming a messiahship which only fizzled and failed. With the ever-increasing desire for Judean freedom, the want to return to a Davidic kingdom which people interpreted out of the various Old Testament prophecies they read, well, the people were ripe for upheaval and revolution. The religious parties, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Essenes, were now being pushed by the zealots in growing numbers who sought insurrection as their solution to the Roman problem. Everyone was anticipating that great leader, the Messiah, the Christ, to reveal himself and to lead the change. There was a great expectation on the people as they watched for the one who would fulfill Zechariah's prophecy 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on a foal of a donkey. It's into this time Jesus appears and approaches Jerusalem with the religious types and radicals both wondering, who is this? Last week, we heard how Jesus had come to Bethany, only two miles down the road from Jerusalem, and how he'd raised Lazarus from the dead. And for the past week, word of this miracle had spread into Jerusalem, as those who had witnessed this miracle began to tell others about it. And the faithful began thinking, this is the Christ. And the religious types began to see him as a real and credible threat to their well-being that needed to be dealt with. And the zealots thought to themselves, if we can just get this guy to be on our side, we can whoop the Romans and drive them out. And the closer that Jesus drew to Jerusalem, the more he was the topic of conversations and speculations. I heard he gave sight to the blind. Well, I heard that he cured the sick. Hey, someone told me he fed thousands out in the desert without a kitchen or even a food truck. Could this guy be the one for whom we've been waiting? And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he did so to the acclaim of the faithful and the skeptical and the zealot alike. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Matthew reports, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. That his welcome was sincere isn't in doubt, as Jesus' own words against the religious types indicate. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? But even those who rejoiced at his grand entrance still didn't fully understand the prophecies nor the meaning of this spectacle. They were just looking for a new king to lead them to victory over their occupying forces. And if indeed Jesus had mounted a white stallion and had rode in on a grand display of royal vestiture, well, maybe that could have been the case, but he didn't. He rode in on the back of a young, unbroken, untried donkey, a colt with its mother alongside. He entered as the humble servant king, not the commander of a longed-for revolution. And though the people shouted the triumphant cry of Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they had forgotten the rest of the psalm that had verses in it like, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and bind the festal sacrifice with cords. Every move that the Lord Jesus Christ made as he walked his path through this world was in exact accord with the prophetic word and therefore was done in obedience to the Father's will. Entering the holy city, Jesus knew it wasn't the throne of a kingdom to which he would ascend, but to a cross. And yet nothing deterred him from, from the purpose for which he had come. While he accepted all the praise of the masses, calling him son of David, he did so with the same grace that had enabled him to endure the cold-cutting criticisms of the religious types. You see, to him... The main thing was not to meet the great expectations of everybody who did not understand what he'd come for, who would even later call for, call for his crucifixion. He came in obedience to his Father's will. St. Paul speaks to the truth of his coming in today's epistle reading for Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. 
He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him that name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Though Jesus did not come to be that warrior king desired by the zealots, he did come for those who couldn't understand his kingly rule as the Lord who will rescue me from every evil attack and who will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever, as Paul tells Timothy. Though Jesus failed to measure up to the religious types' demands and expectations that flowed out of their misguided thinking, he still came for the sake of those who even opposed him. Such a high priest meets our need, the writer to the Hebrews says, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. And even for those who acknowledged him as this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, though they may not have fully comprehended what he was up to, Jesus ascended the cross Christ died for our sins, as Paul writes, according to the scriptures. He is the one who is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. So may we greet our triumphant prophet, priest, and king, who comes to us as Savior and friend, opening our heart to the truly great expectations of our God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life eternal. Amen. We rise and sing.